things. Today, a story. You see, there's the CEO. He happens to have his name on the door of the largest car company in the world, but one known for very dependable cars. And a couple of years ago, he publicly announced they're going to make their cars more exciting looking. Now, that's great and all if he actually had a degree from Art Center or CCS, but instead our CEO has an MBA from a small private college in New England. So what does that really translate to? Well, we're about to find out. You see, when the upscale brand of said car company was going about the business of redesigning their most important car, our fearless CEO rolls into the design studio just as they were about to lock design and says, nope, redo it, because we can do better. So today we go on a bit of a journey. What happens when a guy with the last name of Toyota, who's also been known to race a car or two, rolls into the Lexus design studio at precisely the time they are working on their best-selling car ever and wants to get involved in development, engineering, and especially design? Let's find some examples of better. Now most people that would buy a car like this probably would never even open the hood, but you and I are car guys, so we need to talk about the engine. This is an RX350, which translates to a 3.5 liter V6, puts out 295 horsepower, which comes in at 6,300 RPM, that's 25 over the previous model, and 267 pound-feet of torque, which comes in at a relatively aggressive 4,700 RPM. Now the people that would buy this, they are very interested in fuel economy, I think all of us are. So on the low end, an all-wheel drive V6 is 19 in the city, on the high end, a front-wheel drive V6 is 28. But the things that you and I would be interested in is how the engine is connected to the car. Normally, there's a subframe, engine is attached to the subframe in four places, and the car, basically the engine and the subframe are married to the car in the factory coming like underneath. Uh, here, I had dinner with the uh, chief engineer of the vehicle last night, and he explained there's still four mounting points, but instead of all bolts being mounted to a subframe, the one in the front and the one in the back are mounted to the subframe, but the ones on the side are mounted directly to the unibody, and the entire purpose is to control lateral movement of the engine. So instead of being a counterbalance, it actually works in favor of the vehicle motion. Now let's do the math here again. 295 horsepower and 267 pound-feet of torque. Now normally that sounds all fine and good, but when you get to the point of pulling 4,200 pounds, that's what this thing weighs, that's when you get into a bit of a problem. Because when you get below like sub 300 horsepower and torque and you get into that kind of weight, engines are kind of more stressed to pull that kind of weight. Where here I've been about three, four hours driving in and around Portland, both like in traffic, in town, as well as roads like this, where not exactly perfect, not arrow straight, and not completely smooth. There's been some broken pavement and some elevation changes, which does affect pulling power. And I've been, for lack of a better term, surprised by how smooth the power delivery is. And there's never been an instance where I feel flat-footed here. Like, I, I, I would think that this is not 295 horsepower. I think it actually has more horsepower than what is rated. But I don't think it's a function of the engine. I think it's a function of the engine and the new transmission. Like last year, there was a six speed that was in the base car. And if you got the F Sport, you got the eight speed. Now it's the eight speed across the board. Now granted, in the 450H, that changes. We're gonna cover the 450H in a separate full episode. Come back in a couple of days for that, but I digress. So basically, what you have here is you just have more gears to deal with more situations. So whether you're in town, driving around roads like this, there just is a more optimal gear so the engine isn't as stressed. Now this is an odd segment for you and I to talk about because the people that buy these, they get excited about different things than us. Like for example, waving your hand over the logo opens up the door magically, and I'll admit that is pretty cool. But they also get excited about like little detail touches, like for example, you can now get different inset colors on your wheels, like here's black, you can get silver, there's even like this autumn burnt mist, it's like an, a dark orange, which I'll admit as a design guy, I think is a nice touch. But the things that I get excited about dual exhaust, or now the wheels, they're 20 inches. It starts actually with an 18, that's the base wheel, but these are the optional 20 inch wheels and there's like four different types available. But really the biggest change that excites me the most is the transmission. 
Yes, the transmission, because you actually get more gears. Uh, instead of a six speed, you get eight speeds. But really, how does that affect a vehicle like this, a tall luxury crossover out on the road? So I've always been puzzled by the roads in and around Portland. And don't get me wrong, love Portland. Got very good friends that live here, but I really think it's against Oregon state law to own anything other than a Prius or a Subaru. What you really want to do is take a sports car on roads like this and really test driving dynamics. So it's a bit of an odd day at the office when you have a tall luxury crossover on beautiful roads like this but you and I still need to tend to the business of driving dynamics. So here you've got a McPherson strut system up front. You've got wishbones in the back, generally composed. But let's say we go around this turn here, let's put a little bit more gas into it. And that's where we get some roll in the back, and especially over here as we're going faster, a little bit of lean to each side. And really, that's just a function of the physics of the design of this vehicle. You're carrying 4,200 pounds, the vehicle has a higher center of gravity, and this particular one is all-wheel drive. So it's not exactly the most svelte going around twisties like this. But what they've done here is they've made it a bit more composed this year. Now, in this particular case, we're in this beautiful area, Sorry Island, I believe it's called. And some of the roads, not exactly the most perfect condition, but and there's some elevation changes. So you get a really good test of the vehicle here. Like there's a better turn coming up here. Let's put our foot into it and see how fast we can get around the turn. And the big thing you notice is there's more composure of the roll in the back and the lean side to side. It doesn't really control the squat of the dive, but then again, you'd have to be driving this thing really aggressively to get into squat and dive. Now, in an odd turn of events, we're doing a mid-episode wardrobe change. Yes, this is a silver vehicle, but it's not the same vehicle. This is an RX 350 F Sport, and if you've been following Lexus for a while, F Sport means a different grill, some aero mods, different wheels, some coloring changes, different seats, very cool gauges, and a way in which they amplify the sound from the engine into the interior. But there's one other change here on the RX that affects some of the driving on the road. The biggest thing that we're concerned about is the dampers. Now, it's gonna come as a bit of a surprise when I tell you the dampers aren't any different between this and the base car. But what is different is when you have this adjustable system, how you tune the adjustments, that's what's different in the F-Sport. So right now we're tooling around in eco mode. So that's very much like driving the base RX350. Now let's go to sport mode, and besides the very large reminder in like the Disney-esque screen over there, uh, the dampers stiffen up. And really, that's the biggest difference between the F-Sport and the base 350, really to people like us. Um, so really, what does that translate to on the road here? So there's a slight turn coming up here. The biggest thing you notice is there's significantly less lean and really, the, the next thing you notice is there's less, there's just a wee bit less body roll in the rear. So there's still some pitch, squat, dive, and roll, but you have a tall crossover vehicle. You're not gonna get away from that completely. But as we go through some of these turns here, notice it's significantly more composed. Does it like, would you take this thing and put it up against the Cayenne? No, but it makes your daily driving um, much more balanced. Yet in the immortal words of the Ginsu Knives pitch people, but wait, there's more, Sport Plus. And really two things happen here. Uh, number one, the dampers, they stiffen up yet again. And number two, the throttle mapping changes. So the big thing you notice with the dampers here is that, that body roll we notice in the back um, with the base mode, the eco mode, and some of that lean, it's further mitigated. So if we're going around like rough pavement like this, and that's really where you would notice it in a vehicle like this. I don't see people taking these things on tracks or going canyon carving in an RX350. It's really like um, railroad crossings, broken pavement or rough pavement where there's like undulations here. And this is where the vehicle's significantly more composed in this Sport Plus mode. So I would say this is more like city mode. If you want the vehicle to be more composed in cities like New York, DC, Los Angeles, or Portland where the roads aren't quite as perfect, 
Now as the road gets a little bit more straight, less elevation changes, let's focus back on the throttle mapping. And the biggest thing you notice when you put your foot into this thing is it's much more responsive. The throttle, it just, it, it, there's less hesitation to it. At the end of the day with the F Sport, is it like an X5M replacement? Eh, I think not. But really, what the F Sport package does, it doesn't really make it more sporty. It makes the overall RX350, the vehicle itself, it makes it a much more dynamic and cohesive package. Now, you and I started this episode on a journey to learn about better, some of which can be found on the inside. The more high-tech bits we're going to cover in our coming RX450H hybrid episode. But before you and I part for today, I want to cover two old-world items. Now, if you saw our tech review of this car, you know I went on and on about the design of the interior and how mature it is over other recent Lexus interiors. And like it or not, this is Lexus reimagining what the interior of a luxury car should look like. And I'm actually one of those few people that likes it a lot. In fact, I like the more angular version we find in the IS and the RCF. But back to an example of better, one that we can all agree on, including Akio Toyota. Throughout this episode, we've driven two different RXs, and if you've been really paying attention, they've had different trim pieces on the dash. Now, it's not unusual to have different trim options fitted to your car. In fact, in this case, you can have five different choices. But what's really unique here is not the trim itself, but who manufactures it. It's not Lexus. It's not Toyota. It's actually the same people that have been manufacturing pianos for almost 130 years. So in summary, what do we got? Well, we have kind of the same formula we've had since 1998, which is the reason why Lexus has sold 2.1 million of these since 1998. And to kind of put that in perspective, that's 100,000 units annually. Usually when you have a vehicle with a price point above 40,000 US, it halves volumes. The only other vehicle that sells in these kind of volumes in the same number or at least price point is the BMW 3 Series. So you can see why this is such an important vehicle to Lexus. So here we are for 2016 and we've got a couple of changes over here. This is a perfectly fine vehicle but now they have give us an F Sport and the idea is they want us to believe this is a sportier model but in reality what this is it's a more complete model. It's a more composed model. It's the one you want to be driving around town. Forget about the Sport. This is just the full tilt model. Think of it that way. Now with that I'm going to leave you guys with a question. I never like talking about what you guys can see. Design is a very personal thing, but there's something about this design that's very different, and that is this floating roof line here and here. We've seen this pervasive over at Nissan, but this is the first time we've seen it at a manufacturer other than Nissan. So I'd like your input. What do you guys think of the floating roof line? Does it make it sporty? Does it make the car stand out? Or is there something else I'm completely missing? Let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV all one word, Moto Man TV all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and make sure you come back in the next couple of days when we do the same thing, but instead of a 350 and a 350F Sport, we're going to do it with a 450H, the hybrid, and the 450H F Sport for the first time.